strange stories of peculiar people and extraordinary events throughout history. This is Notorious Narratives. Welcome to Notorious Narratives. I'm Jen. And I'm Robin. And tonight we're going to talk about the Mona Lisa of the Seine, also known as the Unknown Woman of the Seine. Mona Lisa of the Seine. Mm -hmm. So it's um, the Seine River, of course, in Paris. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, right. Do you have any idea where I'm going with this? Paris. Okay. (laughs) But you have no idea the story. No. I love it. Oh, my God. It's my favorite thing to do is to tell a story that... I know you you don't know. Okay. It's so good because it's not easy. I take it as like a personal challenge. <laughs> okay. I'm like, hold on. I think I have this one. I'm actually going to give a shout out to my friend at work, Erin, because she actually mentioned this to me. And I was like, that's a really good fucking idea. Teach me. All right. I'm excited. Just like many of our stories, this is one that is part fact, part oral history, and part artistic embellishment. In the late 1880s in Paris, France, the body of an unknown woman was fished out of the Seine River at the Quai de Louvre. I'm assuming that's Quai de Louvre. somewhere near the Louvre, right? Yeah. Sounds right. I'm going with that. As was the custom at the time, her body was placed on display at the Paris mortuary in hopes that someone would recognize her, identify her, claim her remains, and give her proper burial. That was not the case. Oh. She was not claimed. But the, the I mean, French Jane, Do- Jane Doe. Yeah. Basically. So <laughs> I was I imagine like babies. Like new babies in the ward, like oh, but it's like, like on, on display. Yeah, like on display. So you can be like, oh, that one's mine. Oh. Anyway. But no one claimed her. <laughs> no so one claimed sad. her. So her body showed no signs of trauma. So a suicide was suspected as the cause of death. When she was examined by the pathologist at the Paris morgue, the man was so taken by her natural beauty and the peaceful expression on her face that he decided to have a wax plaster death mask made of her face. So he just found that, like, she looked so peaceful, just like she was asleep. Angelic. Yeah, with, like, just, like, the slightest smile. Mona Lisa. So, yeah, that's where the, that, like, comparison comes from. So many have questioned if this is actually the face of somebody, the facial expression of somebody who could have drowned. But we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Her age was estimated to be somewhere in her mid to late teens, uh, based on the firmness of her skin and the lack of lines in her face. So probably somewhere around, like, 16 or so, is what they say. Over the years, numerous copies of this death mask were made. The copies quickly became a morbid fixtures in the homes of Parisian Bohemian society. Really? So her face was just in people's homes? Yeah, like I would totally would have fucking had one of those. Absolutely. But I'm like, (laughs) wow, I mean, she's... It's like everybody has She's an artistic... A taxidermied squirrel or like a bat, you know? That's pretty cool. So Alfred Camus, French philosopher, author, and journalist, compared her smile to that of Mona Lisa. This led to lots of chat and speculations about what her enigmatic smile could have meant about her life, her death, and her position within society. The cast also represents an important moment in the history of artistic media because it was actually one of the first pieces that was so widely reproduced. Yeah. And the reason why it was able to be so widely reproduced because it was actually photographed. And the photographic negative was actually used to recreate it, was used to recreate all of these wow, um, multiple cool. copies of the cast. The reason why it was so popular is because it was at the exact right time in the history of photography Innovation, yeah, and yeah. yeah, perfect moment where art and science That's pretty met. cool. But right. that, that, what's cool about that, though, is that even though it was like mass production, not all of them were the same. You know, everything is going to be a little off because they're going by yeah. a negative photo. But it was. Like, you would go in the house and you'd be like, oh, it's one of those. But what's great, though, is that every time someone has one, it's kind of like everyone has an original. Yeah, like just a little different. Mm-hmm. So the image was so popular that she was something of an erotic ideal for many women throughout Europe. So all of the young girls would sort of, that was like the ideal of oh beauty. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Try to make yourself look. Is she's like the 1800 Barbie? Um, oh, my God. I did it. Oh, yeah. 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 I mean, I would say so. People would look at these plaster death masks and, and they would want to yeah. like look that beautifully pale and lineless. Yeah. So it was like that She's was. like the 1800 Barbie. Yeah. So <clears throat> actually she was only displaced as uh, like a relative beauty standard throughout Europe by uh, Greta Garbo. Wow. Yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. So as of as recently as 2017, they were still making casts from the original death mask. I'm sorry, when? 2017. The original death mask, or or what is said to be the original death mask, is still found in the Lorenzi workshop in a small haven of peace and antiquity in the busy Parisian suburb of Aracel. 
I should that, have. That's a lot of words. I fucking copy and paste <laughs> that shit hard. Um, I'm so sorry. I would have had to study that for an hour in order for me to get that going. <laughs> God damn. Jesus. Anyway, in the Lorenzi workshop, which is in like this beautiful little Parisian suburb. Yeah. That's, you oh, know, that all full of like antique shops. And it's this place mm-hmm. where they still create masks in the old fashion. So it's one of the last of its kind. Uh, downstairs, the Moliere's where the cast makers create figurines, busts, and statues, pouring plaster into the molds in much the same way that they have since the family business started in the 1870s. But if you want to be face-to-face with history, within this shop, actually upstairs, they have a room that's above the workshop. And it's pretty unsettling because it's just hanging all around you are life and death masks of famous poets, artists, politicians, and revolutionaries. We're talking about Napoleon, Robespierre, Verlaine, Victor Hugo, Beethoven is there. Wow. So they have all of these masks that are everywhere. And so you go down the stairs and you just see all this. Yeah. That yeah. could be shocking, but also awesome at the same time. But there on the wall remains this mask, this beautiful, lineless, you know, teen girl's face. And it's just labeled Le Inconnu de la Seine which is the unknown woman of the same. This face in popular culture was a muse to many poets. They were, you know, poets and authors um, and musicians saw that like beautiful enigmatic smile. One of the first stories featuring her was the 1899 novella, The Worshipper of the Image by Richard Le Gallien, who portrays the mask as a malevolent force, which bewitches and ultimately destroys a young poet. But there have been all sorts of, you know, different stories. I get that. Right. So then a lot of people have just written these tales, yeah. sort of trying to figure out, you know, where she came from, like giving Where's her like a beauty coming. In many works of literature, authors have sought to try to give the ba- a backstory to the unknown woman, creating stories of forbidden love, heartbreak that leads to the woman's eventual suicide. So, I mean, they all know that she probably committed suicide. So there is uh, one. One very popular story that basically says that she was just a young German woman who bore the child of the mask maker and committed suicide when the baby was stillborn. That's the prevalent story. But in that story also, she's actually the guy's daughter, so that's like pretty fucked up. Nope. Anyway. Nope. No. Stories about the mask and her are found in ballet, film, in German, French, Russian, and American literature. But it was another drowning or a near drowning that ensured that the ink in you a place in medical history. In 1955, Asmund Literal saved the life of his young son, Torre, grabbing the boy's lifeless body from the water just in time, clearing his airways. Literal, at that time, was a successful Norwegian toy maker, specialized in making children's toys and dolls, modeled cars, uh, all using, like, new, like, soft plastic. This is around the time when he was approached by Peter Safar, who, along with James Elam, rediscovered the airway, head tilt, chin lift, or mouth-to-mouth breathing components of CPR. CPR, motherfucker. <laughs> to make a training aid for the newly invented technique of CPR. So basically, yeah. They went to him and they said, "Hey, we need you to help us make this doll." Holy shit. So people can learn CPR. So CPR, the combination of chest compressions and the kiss of life can give life to a patient whose heart has stopped. His son's brush with death a few years earlier had made him very receptive to this concept. He developed a torso or a whole body mannequin, which simulates an unconscious person uh, receiving CPR. Asman wanted his mannequin to have a natural appearance. He also felt that a female doll would be less threatening to trainees. Shut up. (laughs) Remembering a mask on the wall from his grandparents' house many years earlier, he decided that the Inconnu de la Seine would become the face of Rosessiani or the CPR mannequin. Shut up. That's awesome. (laughs) Holy shit. If you are one of the 300 million people who have ever been trained in CPR, then you have certainly pressed lips against her. And she is known as the most kissed woman in history. That is the story of the fucking CPR doll. That is beautiful. I love that. You're welcome. The most kissed woman in history. Mm -hmm. That is so pretty. I love that. Oh, (sighs) wow. I, I love that story. That's such a good one. Yep. That's such a good one. Wow. And that is... Uh, you the, kissed her. Yeah, of course. Many times. I mean, I have to get renewed in CPR fucking constantly. And uh, that's the story of the unknown woman of the Seine, the Mona Lisa of the Seine, and the CPR doll, Recessiani. Just another notorious narrative. Have a show idea? Send it on over to us along with any questions, comments, or corrections to notoriousnarratives at gmail.com. 
You can follow us on our Instagram at Notorious Narratives and Twitter at Notorious Tales. And don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe. Every review helps other listeners to find us. Thanks so much.